Just as everything in this world, the Zohar HaKadosh says, everything that exists, regardless of whether it's obvious or not, is either male or female. Zachar or Nekeva. Everything. Even inanimate objects, a door, a table, it must have some leaning towards Zachar or Nekeva. This is something that's stressed in the Zohar HaKadosh. And we know that when is when is there shlemut? When is something complete? When is a family complete? We know that a woman alone certainly is not in a position to create anything or to build anything. And even a man alone, without a wife, he's nothing. He's not in a position to be able to create, to be able to build a family. So when does Hashem love a, a unit? <clears throat> when it's a combination of zachar and ekeva, when we bring together male and female. So too in the Torah, we have the Torah Shebechtav and the Torah Shebaal Peh. We have the Chumash and the Navi, that's classified as the 24 books of the Torah Shebechtav. And we have the 60 Gemarot, the Shas, the Torah Shebaal Peh, that's referred to as the wife, the female part of the Torah, the Shekhinah. Torah Shebaal Peh is referred to in the Sifrei Kabbalah as the Shekhinah, the female. A person who is Zohar to combine both, the Chumash and the Gemara, to learn both, that person is zocheh to bring about this yichud, this bringing together of the heavenly male and female. Now, when a person learns Gemara, the first, the rabbi who had the privilege of having his name mentioned first in the Gemara, Rabbi Eliezer Hagadol, the Gemara says, why was he given this privilege? The reason is because whenever there was a shiur in Torah being given, whether he was one of these students at the shiur, or whether he was the rabbi giving the shiur, he always made it his business to be the first one there. There's an extra credit that's given to those who come early to a shiur, and in a sense, those who don't, they miss out on this extra privilege. Halavai, we should be zocher, that whenever presented an opportunity to show respect for Torah, we should come out looking good. We shouldn't be embarrassed that the Torah waits for us, the correct way to attend the shiur is where the person waits for the Torah to begin. That shows an, an extra respect for Torah. <coughs> Tonight's shiur, we're going we're gonna to discuss a chapter in Likutei Moharan and the associated Likutei Halachot. And this is the, the topic that we're going to discuss is very, very interesting. And on the way driving here to deal tonight, it was mentioned that tonight's shiur corresponds with the front page news, today's front page news. We find throughout Jewish history, we who believe in the Torah, in the Torah Shebaal Peh and the Torah Shebechtav, we believe Shlema in the power of miracles. The fact that Hashem is not dictated to by any power of nature, Hashem is not forced in any way to make the sun rise in the morning and set in the evening. Hashem conducts everything in the world according to His wishes, according to His desire. Each and every single day there's a new creation that takes place. We say this in the tefillah every morning, that Hashem creates the world brand new every morning. And when Hashem creates the world anew, Hashem puts into it, into every day's creation, whatever features He decides to put in or to leave out, whatever options He decides to open or close, this new creation with all new components, everything new, goes on every single day. And we find throughout the generations, there has always been an opposing faction to this. Number one, especially from the Goyim. <clears throat> the Goyim generally believe in this concept of Mother Nature and things in predestination, that things are laid out in the stars, exactly how things are supposed to be. And no matter what you want to do, you can't change that. You can't affect it. And we find throughout the generations, the Goyim have tried many, many times to disprove the miracles mentioned in the Torah, be it the miracle of the splitting of the Red Sea, they try to show how, based on scientific fact, chas v'shalom, the splitting of the Red Sea took place just at that point. There was an equinox and the sun and the moon lined up in such a way where the water happened to split just at the exact moment when the Jews went in, and then it closed up just at the exact moment when the Egyptians 
were inside and drowned them and they were saved. All of this just happened to happen. It was coincidental act of nature. Has v'shalom, as they tried to say. And with this type of attitude, they try to cover up all the miracles mentioned in the Torah. In today's newspapers, in the New York Post specifically today, they happen to refer to the story of King David fighting Goliath, David HaMelech, against Goliath, and they try to explain, again, trying to use their limited knowledge, their limited scope, <coughs> how the fact that Goliath, Goliath was so large wasn't a sign of strength, just the opposite, it was a sign of illness. He had an overgrown pituitary gland, and that's what made him so big and clumsy and naturally so easy to defeat. It's not that David Amilach did anything special, he knocked over a sick man, a big clumsy sick man. And they mention, they try, I don't, want, I, don't, I don't even mention the rest of their words, how they continue to try to undermine and underrate this outstanding item that's mentioned in the Torah, and they try to do this in many, many cases. Rabbi Nazar, in Likutei Moharan, in the second section of Likutei Moharan, which is called Likutei Moharan Tanina, devotes one chapter, chapter four, to speaking about this topic, about the emunah, the faith of the Jews, which he refers to in a certain manner, as we're going to explain, versus these chachmei hateva, as they're called in Hebrew, these scientists, philosopher types who try to undermine the Jews' faith in Hashem, faith in Sadiqim, faith in the Torah, faith in the power of miracles, try to undermine these items and try to confuse or to destroy our faith in Hashem and the Torah. First, we're going to mention a whole series of items introductory and leading up to this conflict. <coughs> Rabbi Nuzal says, that one of the most outstanding mitzvot that a Jew has the privilege of doing is the mitzvah of tzedakah, the mitzvah of giving charity. Rabbi Nassau says, when is charity really classified? When is a person classified as having accomplished the true mitzvah of tzedakah? It's only when it hurts. It's only when it hurts. When a person has to force himself a little bit to give, that's when he knows he's accomplished the true mitzvah of tzedakah. Where do we see this? We find the Torah tells us that Eliyahu Hanavi at one point was forced to go into hiding because he got into a conflict with the Jewish king at that time who was worshipping idols and doing all kinds of averot. And Eliyahu Hanavi told him that because of what he's doing, he's going to punish him. He's going to remove any chance of any rain coming. And because of this, he was forced to go into hiding. And the Torah says that Hashem wanted to show an act of charity, wanted to give tzedakah to Eliyahu Navi. Note, the Gemara says that even the richest, this is brought in Shulchan Aruch, that even the richest person, the wealthiest man, whenever he's in transit, if he's traveling, he's going on a business trip or anything like that, he's classified as a poor man, meaning that any money that's given to him or any food that's given to him, to help him, or if somebody gives him a place of lodging, although we say that generally the concept of charity is giving to a poor man, the richest person, when he's in transit, is classified as a poor man. He needs a place to sleep. He's not at home. He's in an outside city. If you give him a place to sleep, it's categorized as hachnasat orchim for a poor man. If you give him a meal, you invite him into your house, you give him a meal, you get the mitzvah of tzedakah. So Eliyahu Anavi, because he was forced to go into hiding in this manner, he was classified as Anani, a poor person. And Hashem said that Hashem is going to accept upon himself the mitzvah of feeding this poor man, giving tzedakah to Eliyahu Anavi. In what manner? Hashem said he's going to use one of his messengers to support Eliyahu Anavi, to provide food for him. Which messenger? The raven. The Pasuk says, Ve'et ho'orvin tziviti lechal kaleka. Hashem said to Eliyahu Navi, I have commanded the ravens to provide you with food. They're going to be the ones to bring you food. Rabbi Nezal says, what message is there in these words? What is the Torah trying to teach us in telling us that Hashem used the raven to provide charity? Rabbi Nezal says, when does a person get credit as having accomplished the true mitzvah of tzedakah? When he has to act like a raven, when he has to behave like a raven. A raven is known to be a bird that has no pity on its own young. 
We find that many times when a person wants to give tzedakah, there's a yetzer hara. The yetzer hara comes in and tells him, charity begins at home. How can you give this other person money or a meal? You have your own children to feed and your own house, your own family. You want to put up a new, a brand new, you want to install a new $300,000 kitchen in your home. And if you give tzedakah, if you give $100 or $1,000 to this yeshiva, you're not going to have the money. You're going to be subtracting from yourself. So the Satan tries to get a person to have this wrong type of pity on himself, this selfishness for himself or for his family, <clears throat> and in this way not wanting to share with others, with outsiders. Rabbi Nezal says, the, the Mishnah says in Perkei Avot, Yehi betcha pasuach l'revacha, that a person's house should be open wide, the doors should be open wide to welcome in guests, and the poor people should always be your always be members of your house. They should always be welcome in your house. One of the interpretations of this Mishnah is Your own family, your own children, let them be poor. In other words, take away from them to be able to have enough to provide an extra portion, an extra plate, an extra five plates. There are five guests in the shul who need a place to eat. Make, subtract from your own family's plates to be able to give them. That's the true mitzvah tzedakah. It requires a person at times showing a meanness towards himself or those that are close to him in order to give to others. That's when a person has is forced to do that. And it takes this extra push to force himself to go against his normal nature, which would be normally, I default to myself. Which person do I feel closest to? Myself, or my family, my wife and children. And I feel a hesitancy, a holding back and wanting to share with others. When a person breaks that, that's when he has accomplished the true mitzvah of tzedakah. And the Rabbi Nezal says that this mitzvah of tzedakah helps a person in a fantastic way, which we're going to explain in a short while. First, Rabbi Nezal goes on to explain a few other things, and then he goes back to explain how tzedakah helps the problem that we're about to discuss. We know the Mepharashim, the Gemara tells us, the Mepharashim tell us that a person, <coughs> if a person would want to spend their whole day, 24 hours a day, taking care of just their physical requirements in this world, there's enough to do. The sleeping, the amount of time that a person has to sleep and eat and get dressed and go to the bathroom and, and work to earn money to be able to eat and sleep and get dressed and go to the bathroom. All of these items, by most people in this world, that takes up their whole life, period. Just providing for the physical needs of yourself and your family which in a sense for a Jew who wants to be religious, who wants to use his time on this earth for coming close to Hashem or helping others come close to Hashem, how does he, how does he deal with this problem? The fact that he has to combat and compete with a situation where on one hand he could, there is a possibility of using up all of his time and effort in just providing for the physical functions that he needs on a daily basis for him and his family. And yet we know, the Gemara tells us, the Zohar Kadosh tells us, that when a Jew goes about his business of waking up in the morning and praying and eating breakfast and going to work, each one of those items, even the eating and the going to work, there are tremendous items, heavenly items that are accomplished if the Jew conducts himself according to the Torah. If when he eats he makes a beracha before, a beracha after, he gives ma'aser from the money that he earns, and he sees to it to work in an honest way to conduct his business in an honest way, every single item that he does is still is considered to a degree a mitzvah. But yet, we know the fact is that the Gemara says that a Jew in this world <coughs> that the correct way for a Jew to conduct himself in this world is that his religious activities should occupy the majority of his time and the gashmiut, the physical, the working and the eating and the sleeping and the buying clothes and all of that should occupy a minority of his time, a minority of his brain. How could a person be zochet to that? When a person finds that there's a certain amount of money that he needs to be able to feed his family, to be able to provide just for necessities. We're not talking about of expanding and trying to live in super luxury, just to handle the bare necessities requires so much time and effort. 
Rabbi Rizal says the fact remains that there does exist a chesed by Hashem, a level of kindness by Hashem, where Hashem could provide a person with all of his needs without the person having to move a muscle, without the person having to put in any effort at all. And if you might want to ask, we know the Zohar Kadush says that generally, whenever a person wants to draw any shefa from heaven, if a person ever wants to receive anything from heaven, he's got to do something on earth first. Hashem helps those that help themselves. Meaning, you have to make the first move. You have to pray. You have to do something. You have to open up a little opening, and Hashem will take it from there. So if that's the case, that seems to imply that I do have to do something. But Rabbi Nezal says the fact is that when Hashem first created this world, when this world was created, was there anything that preceded it? Was there any deed of mankind that was done that Hashem, that, that, the, that a person did this and this thing, and because of that Hashem created the world? The answer is no. The fact is that there was a power of chesed by Hashem, a power of kindness that was so great, a type of chesed chinam. A freebie. Hashem created the world based on no good deed that had been done yet by any human being. So Rabbi Nezal says we see that there exists this fantastic level of kindness by Hashem whereby there is a potential for Hashem to show a person such chesed where a person would not have to go to work at all whatsoever and a person would not have to do anything whatsoever and Hashem could provide him with all of his needs completely. There does exist such an item by Hashem. But the problem is, Rabbi Nezal says, if a person tries to draw on this power, Rabbi Nezal says we know there's danger involved. Why? Because we're dealing with high voltage. We're dealing with super powerful chesed, super powerful kindness, we know the Gemara says in Ta'anit, the Gemara tells the story that there was no rain and the rabbis prayed for rain and the rain started pouring down where they thought that the whole city would be flooded away. So they had to pray to Hashem to hold back the rain. So we see there is a concept of too much good where unless the good can be contained within a vessel, unless it can be confined and constricted properly, chas v'shalom, this too much good could do damage. We find the Gemara tells us that when Hashem first created the world, on one of the days of creation, the Pasuk says, Vayar Hashem et kol Hashem saw everything that He made, v'hine tov, and it was good. The Gemara says, what does this refer to? On that day Hashem created the Yetzer Tov, the good inclination. The next day, the following day of creation, the Pasuk says that Hashem saw everything that He had created, v'hine tov ma'od, it was very good. The Gemara says, what's very good? That's the Malach Hamavet. That's the angel of death. He's referred to as very good. Because we know very is always dangerous. Too much light is damaging. A person looks straight into the sun, they can be blinded by it. So there is this concept of Rov Tov Mosrot. Mosrot means anything that's extra, wasteful. That's the symbol of klipa. That's the symbol of tumah, something that's not necessary, like hair, certain items in the body which seem not to serve any function, any necessary function. They're extra. That's the place where the kilipot reside. For example, this is why the Torah instructs a person not that a Jew is not permitted to have long hair because hair represents tumah. Not to have raw, long nails because these items are referred to as extra, too much, unnecessary. So we see that when we're dealing with very good, if Hashem were to be very kind to us, that could be dangerous also. So the meaning of nazir. Excuse me? Nazir. That's an exceptional case where because of a... And again, the fact is that a nazir has to bring a korban to forgive for the crime that he added to the Torah. Hashem gave 613 commandments. No, but the hair. Exactly. The answer is why he has long hair. It's a whole separate discussion. There's, there's a special no, reason. The hair is, is tomorrow. The hair usually is tomorrow. You note that after he finishes, he has to cut it off, shave it off completely. 
Note a melech or a kohen, the ones who have to serve, the ones who are closest to Hashem, a melech had to have his hair cut every single day. Kohen Gadol, the same thing, a special kind of haircut, because they have to be exceptionally, exceptionally careful with this power of Tumah. Why the melech? Because the melech is the most dangerous spot. Ragleha Yordot Mavet, the Pasuk says, that the malchut is the lowest quality of Hashem, and the ten sefirot, malchut is the lowest one, the closest to the Tumah. If the Tumah would want to latch on to something, that would be the first thing it would attack. The Jewish king, he's the one who's most danger in the most dangerous position. <clears throat> Therefore, he has to be most careful with these items. But I, I want to get off track. We'll, we'll talk about that. <clears throat> so Rabbi Nezal says that this rov tuv, this too much good, could be dangerous unless a person prepares a keli, a vessel, into which it can be contained and held solidly, then it's safe. Then the person is safe. What is the keli? What's the vessel that a person has to create in which to be able to receive this fantastic kindness from Hashem, which would possibly afford the person an opportunity to be what? To be totally free of having to go to work, totally free of having to devote most of his time to Gashmiu, to those things. What do we call that? That's called Kohen. We know that the Kohanim, in the time of the Bet HaMikdash, they were free from having to go to work, they were free from having to deal with Parnassah, their needs were provided for by the rest of the Jewish people. There's a pasuk that says that Latid Lavo, there's going to come a time when the Amdu Zarim, strangers, will rise up, the Goyim, they will take care of the sheep of the Jews, Atem, and you, the Jews, Kohane Hashem Tikru. All the Jews will be called heavenly priests, meaning no Jew will have to go to work, no Jew will have to do anything to provide for his physical needs. It will all be completely taken care of by others. So we see what is that called when Hashem elevates a person to such a level where this person draws from this super chesed of Hashem and he's able not to have to, not to, have to put in a lot of effort to provide for his physical needs. That's the level of Kohen. So the Pasuk says that in the future, the whole Jewish nation will become a nation You'll be a nation of Kohen. All of you will be able to draw this fantastic chesed. What's the keli to contain this in? Rabbi Nezal says the vessel that a person has to prepare into which to be able to contain this fantastic chesed is called yir'ah, fear of Hashem. If a person is zokhe to have the proper degree of fear of Hashem, that's what serves as the keli, the vessel into which can be poured this fantastic chesed and it can hold it, it can contain it. Where do we see this? There's a pasuk that says, Umechokek mi ben raglav, that it was carved out between his feet. This word mechokek, to carve out, represents carving out an opening, carving out an opening, a, a, an aperture in the ground to be able to hold something, digging a hole into which can be poured something. Where is that? Mi ben raglav, at the feet, at the bottom. The Torah says what quality is there that's referred to as the feet, the bottom, that's fear of Hashem. There's a pasuk that says, Sof davar hakol nishma et kizehu kol ha'adam. What's the bottom line? What's the feet of the Torah, the support of the Torah? Yireh elokim, fear of Hashem. Showing the proper fear of Hashem, that's the legs on which these Torah is supported. That's the item which serves as this mechokek, this chakika. That's what carves out a vessel into which can be contained this fantastic chesed of Hashem. Now the question is, how is a Jew zocheh to have true fear of Hashem? How? What items are there that help a person be zocheh to have true fear of Hashem? Rabbi Nezal says, just as by a human being, if a human being wants people to fear him, how does he get them to fear him? He has to show the people something fantastic, something awesome. By Hashem, whenever Hashem shows his power to the Jewish people, in what way? That he's so power, he's so powerful, that he's able to do something that goes against the laws of nature, 
That's what imposes a fear of Hashem. That's what makes the people afraid of Hashem. When they see Hashem do a miracle, perform a miracle, that's what fills the people with fear of Hashem. Just as we find at the splitting of the Red Sea, the Pasuk says, Vayar Yisrael et hayad agdola, the Jews saw this fantastic miracle, Vayiru ha'am et Hashem, the people became afraid of Hashem. What makes people afraid? Seeing a miracle. So Rabbi Nezal says you should know that the three holidays of Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, these three holidays that the Jews keep, these three holidays are what help a person be zocher to have true fear of Hashem. Why? Why do we celebrate Pesach? Why do we celebrate Sukkot? Why Shavuot? Each one of these holidays is celebrated to commemorate a miracle, a specific miracle, a case where Hashem showed His fantastic power in overriding the laws of nature. Pesach, the ten plagues that were inflicted on Egypt, the whole country got turned inside out, upside down. All the miracles that took place there, where for the Goyim it was dark, for the Jews it was light. The Bechot of the Goyim died, this one lived. The water split in half, red for the Goy, blood for the Goy, white clear for the Jew. All the miracles that took place on that holiday. On Sukkot, the miracle of the special clouds that traveled with the Jews throughout the desert, laundering their clothing for them, protecting them. On Shavuot, the miracles that took place when Hashem gave the Torah on Har Sinai, all the fantastic miracles that took place there, the people were able to see sound, and they were able to hear light, fantastic miracles that the Gemara discusses, which we can't fathom at all. This is why we celebrate these three holidays. They're called Mikra Kodesh. They proclaim the holiness of Hashem, the awesomeness of Hashem, in being able to perform these miracles, in being able to override the laws of nature. And this is why the Pasuk says, Shalosh Pa'amim Bashana Yera'e Kol Zechurcha. Three times a year, every single Jewish male is required to come visit the Beit HaMikdash to be zochet, to receive this fear of Hashem, to draw this fear of Hashem upon him. The word yera'e means to see. The word yera'e is also milashon yira, to be filled with fear. Now, Ben Israel says that these three holidays, which remind us of the miracles that Hashem performed on these holidays, these things are what help a, a Jew be zochet to have true fear of Hashem. And the Rabbein Azal refers to this as a Hidgalut Haratzon. When Hashem reveals that it's within His control, it's within His desire that whatever Hashem wants, Hashem can do, it's not predetermined by anything, it's not predestined, it's not controlled by anything, that item is what injects true fear of Hashem upon the people. Rabbein Azal says, however, there is a problem. So, in other words, we would say that if a Jew is zochet to keep these three holidays the right way, to perform all the mitzvot on them, and to, pray, and, and to conduct himself properly to visit his rabbi, all the things, all the mitzvot that a Jew is supposed to do on Yom Tov, a Jew would be zochet to complete himself in true fear of Hashem. <coughs> rabbi Nezal says, however, there is a problem. There are these chachme hateva, these scientist philosopher types, who try to deny and undermine the miracles of Hashem, who try to convince the Jews that these things never happened, or if it did happen, it happened within the confines of nature, etc., etc., and they attack the holidays of the Jews. David HaMelech says in Tehillim, Sha'agu tzorerecha bekerev mo'adecha, the enemies of Hashem, tzorerecha, they scream, Sha'agu, they scream, bekerev mo'adecha, within the holidays, Within the holidays, they scream, they try to uproot this fear of Hashem that the holidays would impose on the Jews. They try to uproot that, to undermine that. Samu ototam otot. They try to make the signs of the zodiac and the constellations, they try to say that that's what controls everything. The laws of nature guided by the stars and all of that, that's what's in control. Rabbi Nezal says, that these people present a tremendous problem because they destroy a Jews, they destroy the, the emunah in miracles and everything, they destroy the fear of Hashem and they prevent the Jews from being able to draw upon themselves this fantastic chesed that we spoke about before. <coughs> Rabbi Nehemiah said, where do they draw their power from? Where do these chachmei hateva draw their nourishment from? How do they get their power? 
La Bédesson says that their power comes, it originates from the elders of the generation, the older people. Now these Chachmei HaTeva are called Chayot Ra'ot. They're called wild animals. Why? Because just as a wild animal comes and attacks a flock and it carries away sheep, a lion, a bear, <coughs> these other types of animals who come and attack a flock of sheep and they tear up, they tear and destroy in order to be able to eat, so too the Jewish nation as a whole is referred to as Tzon, as the sheep of Hashem. And these people, these scientists, philosopher types, they prey on the Jewish people, P-R-E-Y, and they, they tear up, they have many victims. There are many people who fall victim, they read their books, and they lose their emunah, the Torah, the Gemara, and the words of the Torah about the miracles that Hashem performed, and all of these things. Rabbi Nezal says, where do they draw their power from? Their power comes from the elders of the generation, people who get to live to be old, and they don't use their days. They waste their days. People who get 70, 80 years old, whatever age, this could be a 13-year-old who's letting his days go to waste. He's conducting himself as an older person who has nothing to do. He's retired, so there's nothing to do. There's no mitzvot to do. There's no Torah to be studied. Those people... Each Jew, we know that when a Jew is born in the morning, he, uh, when a Jew is, is created new every day, he gets his nishama brand new, he's given a brand new spiritual life that he's to use for that day, a power of energy, a battery, a new charge for that day. If he uses it, if he makes mitzvot, if he does mitzvot and he studies Torah, that energy gets used up in mitzvot, in elevating and heightening the Shekhinah, in bringing closer the coming of the Mashiach, in accomplishing fantastic things. If a Jew does nothing with that energy that he's given, he wastes it, chas v'shalom, where does that energy go? Does it go into, turn into nothing? No. That's what's used to support the tum'ah, the satan, this power of these wild animals, as they're called. The ones who challenge the Torah and everything, they draw their power from these people, these elders who don't use their days in any way, they're the ones, their days, where do their days go to? It goes to support this Metzah Hanachash, as Rabbi Nezal calls it. These wild animals, these philosopher scientists who draw away, who try to undermine the power of the Kiddushah, of Yom Tov, in proclaiming the miracles of Hashem, this is where they draw their power. Rabbi Nezal says, how do we combat this? How do we fix up this problem? There are two things. Rabbi Nezal says, every tzaddik in the world, every Talmud Chacham, and especially the tzaddik emet, the leading tzaddik, the Chochmah, the Torah that he teaches to the Jews, the more Torah he teaches, the more people learn about Hashem, the more they build up their faith in Hashem, and this is how he combats this power that would work chas v'shalom in undermining the three holidays and the emunah that they give, the fear of Hashem that they put into, a Jew, into the Jews. So one person who combats these chayot ra'ot is the Talmud Chacham, that's one. Rabbi Nezal says the other item that combats this is the mitzvah of tzedakah. Each time a Jew gives tzedakah, what does he do? What he does is he fixes up these days, the Pasuk says about giving tzedakah, the Pasuk says, Shlach lachmecha al hamayim, send out, spread out your bread on the waters, ki berov yamim yitim And in many days, you'll, you'll find it, meaning, the literal translation here is that if a person is charitable, he'll find that should he ever need any charity, people will be happy to give it to him, because they saw that when he was in a position to give, he gave. But note the wording in the Pasuk. <coughs> the, the Pasuk says, Shlach lach machal p'nei send out your bread on the waters, ki berov yamin tim In many days, you will find it. You will find the benefits of this mitzvah tzedakah in many days. By those people who live many days, who live this long life, which they don't use for Kiddushah, they don't make mitzvot, they don't study Torah, by those people, that's where this tzedakah has been accomplished. Tzedakah is what <coughs> fixes up those days that were wasted, and it accomplishes, the, it, it subdues these wild animals, these scientist philosophers, which are referred to in the Sefarim as these wild animals who try to destroy many from the flock of Hashem, and it allows the power of Yom Tov to shine forth in its proper, in its full blossom. 
thereby the Jews are filled with a solid fear of Hashem, that's what acts as the keli, the vessel, into which to contain this extra kindness from Hashem, and this is how the Jews can get to this level of Kohen, super Kohen. This is what Rabbein Azal explains in a chapter in Likutei Moharayim. Now, to bring this down to earth, to show us how this applies to us on a daily basis. The question is, these holidays come three times a year. What do I do every day? How does this apply to me every day? We said that, why is it that these holidays, these Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, help a Jew, Bizochet, the true fear of Hashem? <coughs> because of the miracles that they represent. Each and every single day, when a Jew goes to pray to Hashem, the act of going to pray to Hashem, that alone proves that the person believes in a concept of miracle, in the fact that things are not forced by nature. Because if I believe that what was going to happen to me today is already predetermined, predestined, why would I pray? <coughs> why would I ask Hashem to give me parnasa and health and this and that if it's all predestined? It's all guided by the stars. The fact that a person goes to pray to Hashem, that in itself shows, just as the holidays, Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, the fact that a person keeps those holidays shows that he believes in the miracles that happen on those holidays. Each and every single time a Jew goes to pray, he's also showing his faith in the power and that everything is in Hashem's control to conduct. Rabbi Natan Zal writes in Kutei Halachot, this is why the Chachamim instituted that how many times a day do we pray? Exactly three times a day. The three prayers that we say every day correspond to the three forefathers of the Jews, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. They were the ones who invented these three tefilot, Shachmit, Mincha, and Arbit. And these three times a day correspond <coughs> to the three holidays, Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot. A person who is zocheh to pray with the proper kavanah every single day, Shachit, Mincha, Arbit, he's actually drawing upon himself this praying alone will fill him with fear of Hashem, a comparable type of fear of Hashem that a Jew could get from these three holidays, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. But the question is, we said that even though if we have these holidays, there is a power that would try to challenge these holidays. There's these evil Rishayim, these smart people, these learned people who are learned in the wrong types of wisdoms, philosophy and the wrong type of science, and they try to undermine the miracles, and we require Chochmah, wisdom, to be able to overcome them. Where do we have this wisdom in the tefillah that we say every day? Where do we see this wisdom? The answer is, this is, this, this is the reason why twice a week, on Monday and on Thursday, <coughs> we have Kriyat HaTorah. We read the Torah in the middle of the tefillah. What's the purpose of this reading of the Torah? The Arizal explains, we're going to mention something really fantastic now. It would pay very much to pay attention to this. The students of the Arizal write that the Arizal said that if a person wants to know, if a person wants to know how to have the proper kavanah in tefillah, you have to first know a little bit about it. We know the Gemara tells us that the throne of Hashem, the Merkava, the throne of Hashem, has the forms, certain pictures on it, the pictures, the faces of certain animals. And therefore, because these animals appear on the throne of Hashem, a Jew is not permitted to have any image in their house that would mimic this in any way. What are the four faces on the throne? You have the face of a lion, that's one. Aryeh is a lion. Shur is an ox. Nesher is an eagle. And the fourth face is the face of Adam, of a person, a humanly face. The, the Gemara tells us, and the Pesukim and Navi tell us, that these are the four images on the four legs of the throne of Hashem. There appear these four faces, a lion, an ox, an eagle, and a human face. These represent the four chayot of Kiddushah. That's what they're called. Or although actually there are three of them. There are three animals, one human. These three animals, the lion, the ox, and the eagle, they represent three animals of Kiddushah. Corresponding to them, corresponding to these three animals that appear on the throne, we have the three tefillot that a Jew prays every single day. Shachrit, Mincha, and Arbit. Where do we see this? 
Shachrit, who is the one, which forefather of the Jews gave us Shachrit? Avraham Avinu. The Pasuk mm -hmm. says, Vayashkem Avraham Baboker. Avraham woke up in the morning, he prayed in the morning. <coughs> What was Avraham? Avraham is the one who said he named the mountain Yira ki behar Hashem Yira'e. Hashem revealed himself to Avraham on the mountain. The Pasuk says ki behar Hashem Yira'e. The Anisal says this word Yira'e, Hashem appeared to Avraham on the mountain. The word Yira'e is the letters Arye. The tefillah which Avraham Avinu gave to the Jews, this Shachrit, that corresponds to the image of the lion on the throne of Hashem. The second one, Mincha, was given to us by Yitzchak Avinu. The Pasuk says, Vayitzhe Yitzchak Lasuach Basadeh. He went out to pray in the field in the afternoon. What was he praying? Mincha. Yitzchak Avinu, Mincha, corresponds to the image of the ox. Why? What were oxen used for by the Jews? They were the ones that were sacrificed on the Mizbeach. Which forefather of the Jews stretched out his neck on the Mizbeach to be used as a korban? This was Yitzchak Avinu. Therefore, his tefillah corresponds to the image of the Shur on the heavenly throne. The third one, Arabit, which was given to us by Yaakov Avinu, that corresponds to the Nesher, to the eagle. Because the eagle is known as the one who hovers who protects, he keeps his children above him. He's the one who flies way, way up, the highest, the bird that flies highest up in the air. And he keeps his children, his, his young, above his wings, so that if anyone would want to shoot at the eagle, as shoot at his young, the bullet would have to get through him first before it can get to its young. The eagle is very protective of its children. Which forefather of the Jews was there that was okay to have children? that he was completely protective of, where his children were all mitah shlema, perfect, all of his children were okay. Abraham Avinu had a son Yishmael. Yitzchak had a son Esav. The first one whose young was all perfect was Yaakov Avinu. So Yaakov Avinu is represented by the eagle. There are many, there are other reasons that are given. The Yisrael Kadosh says Nishra Darucha and Ruach is Yaakov Avinu. He corresponds to Zerampen. We can't go into that in too much detail now, but just for now alone, the explanation that the Arizal gives in that the eagle is extra protective over its young, just as Yaakov Avinu is the one who was the, his the Ruach Avatechi Ruach Yaakov Avihem, the Pasuk says. That term Ruach applies specifically to the eagle. So those are the three images of the animal, of, of, the, of the animals that appear on the heavenly throne. The fourth one is the image of a person. The Arisa says that if a person is zochet to pray shahid mincha arbit with kavana every day, this is how he himself completes the four images on the throne. The Arizal says, however, you should know that there are three <coughs> animals of Tum'ah. There are three animals that represent Tum'ah that are the opposite of these three animals of Kiddushah, whose faces appear on the throne of Hashem. And these animals of Tum'ah, chas v'shalom, they would challenge. They're the ones, when a person prays, shachit min harabid, and he has bad thoughts while he's praying, or he can't concentrate, where does that come from? That comes from these three bad animals, which are Kelev, a dog, Chamor, a donkey, and Nitz, a hawk. These are the three animals. The Tikkun Zohar mentions them, and the Arizal mentions them. These three animals represent Klipa, Tum'ah. They represent animals of Tum'ah, and they're the ones who oppose these three animals of Kiddushah. They oppose these three animals of Kiddushah, and as a result, they're the ones who try to undermine and hurt the tefillah, these three tefillot of a person. My tape is uh, in my, in my head, yeah? These three animals, the dog, the donkey, and the hawk, there are reasons, again, we can't go into explaining the whole thing for now, we're just listing these items, and we're quoting the sources that mention to us that these three represent tum'ah, evil, wicked. 
And these three oppose the three animals of Kiddushah. This is why the, the, the Arizal says that if a person knows that if he's not careful to pray with Kavanah, if he doesn't try to concentrate and pray well, these things, he could chas v'shalom, overpower his tefillah. So therefore, if a person is aware of this, he's conscious of the fact that there is this power that we want to harm and tear up his tefillah. <coughs> if a person is not aware of that, if a person is aware of that, he knows to be much more careful to pray with Kavanah. The Arizal says that this is what's hinted to in a pasuk that Shlomo HaMelech said. The pasuk says in Mishlei, Shlomo HaMelech says, Einecha lenochach yabitu, if your eyes will look straight ahead in, the, in a proper direction, af apecha yaishiru negdecha, then your eyelids will, will point you in a straight path, will lead you on a righteous path. The Arizal says, what does this refer to? What is this pasuk, pasuk hinting to? Einecha lenochach yabitu. If a person will be conscious of this problem, which problem? The fact that there are these three animals which represent this, this power of Tum'ah, which tries to combat the three tefillot, which tries to combat the three holidays of the Jews, which try to encourage us in emunah and fear of Hashem, if a person will be conscious of that, this word nochach, einecha lenochach yabitu, the word nochach, the nun, stands for netz, the hawk, the chaf stands for kelev, the dog, the chet stands for the chamor, the donkey, these three animals of tum'ah, einecha lenochach yabitu, if the person will be conscious of these three wild animals which are trying to tear up his tefillah, and, they would, they, and, and if he doesn't concentrate properly, if he doesn't have kavanah chas v'shalom, they would harm his tefillah, then afatecha yashiru netecha. Then a person will have kavanah and he'll pray the right way, and he'll be zocher that he alone will complete the merkava of Hashem. This person praying the three tefillot, shachrit mincha arbit, will complete the adam, the arye shor nesher of the merkava. <coughs> now we see here that the Arizal tells us here we see the connection now between the three holidays and these wild animals that Rabbi Nezal refers to. He calls these philosopher scientists, he calls them wild animals that try to damage the power of the holidays. These correspond to these three wild animals that are mentioned in the Tikkune Zohar that try to challenge the three tefilot of a Jew. How do we combat them? This is why we have Kriyat HaTorah specifically on Monday and Thursday. We'll explain in a minute why Monday and Thursday. But we have Kriyat HaTorah, the reading of the Torah. That's the wisdom. That represents the Talmid Chacham. Using the wisdom of the Torah alone to be able to combat them, to be able to weaken them, to be able to weaken these scientists, philosophers, who would try to disprove the faith in Hashem. It's the reading of the Torah, the study of Torah, person becomes knowledgeable about Hashem, they have the answers to these questions. <clears throat> However, we said that that's not the, the... Now, this is why you'll note that in the reading of the Torah, all the laws about reading of the Torah show us what the function of the Torah is. What's the function of the Torah? To support these three tefillot, shachrit, mincha, arbit. Therefore, the Shulchan Aruch tells us, based on the Gemara, that whenever you call up a person to the Sefer Torah, what's the minimum amount of psukim you're allowed to read for a person? Three. Minimum of three psukim for a person. Whenever you take the Sefer Torah out of the Hechal to read it, what's the minimum number of people that you must call up to the Torah in order to be allowed to take the Torah out of the Hechal? Three. Why? The reason is because this is the purpose of the Torah. The purpose of the Torah is to protect these three tefillot, shachrit bin Kharbit. To protect these three holidays. The purpose of the Chokhmah is to be able to protect the Yir'ah. The fear of Hashem that a person would get from these three holidays, from these three tefillot. The purpose of the reading of the Torah is to serve as the Chokhmah that will protect that item from being damaged by these scientist philosophers who would want to threaten the Emunah in these items. However, Rabbi Nezal said that besides that, besides this Chokhmah, you need Tzedakah. Rabbi Nezal said that the final item that cuts this item off at its source, that fixes up the days of these people who waste away their days, that gives power
power to these philosophers, scientists, is Sedaka. Where do we see this? We find the Shulchan Aruch tells us that when it comes to the reading of the Torah, at the end of the reading of the Torah, there's the mitzvah of picking up the Sefer Torah, Hagba and Gelila, those mitzvot. And the Hagba, the picking up of the Sefer Torah, the Shulchan Aruch tells us that it's a minhag to pay, to spend money on that. People many times bid for that, to buy that privilege of doing that, because that's considered a tremendous mitzvah. Rabbi Natanzal explains that it's the money that people spend on this mitzvah, that's classified as this tzedakah, that completes the reading of the Torah, that adds a completion to this, in being able to help us fix up completely any damage that could have been done by these philosopher scientists who would want to undermine the faith in Hashem. Now note, we said, what's the purpose of all of this? to get the Jews to a level where they should all be like Kohanim. That if a Jew is Zocher, to have the proper faith in Hashem, that it doesn't require his work, it's not his going out to work that earns his Parnassah, that Hashem is capable of overriding all the laws of nature and giving him whatever he needs, then Hashem can bestow upon such a person such a level of Chesed that he wouldn't have to make any move. He would be a Kohen. He would be supported by Hashem. He would be a heavenly priest. Rabbi Natan Sal explains this is the secret why. Where do we have this? We have the Birchat Kohanim, the blessing of the Kohanim every single day in Eretz Israel or by the Sfaradim Azochet. I have that every single day. We say Birchat Kohanim. Which place in the Tefillah do we say that? That comes together with Modim, the paragraph Modim, where we say, we, we acknowledge Tashem, Al Nisecha Shebechol Yom Imanu, all the miracles, we acknowledge all the miracles, Va'al Niflaotecha Vetovotecha Shebechol Yom Vayom, Erev Avoker Vetzoharayim, the three we list, Erev Boker Tzoharayim, referring to the three Tefilot, showing that we believe that each and every single one of the three tefillot, shachrit mincha arbit, that we pray, why do we get up to pray? Because we believe that our prayer can change nature. That if nature dictates that a person is supposed to be sick, I can pray and override that and make him all better. If nature dictates that this person is supposed to be poor, if that's what's written in the stars, a person can pray for Parnasan, Hashem can give him whatever he needs. Therefore, it's in that place in the tefillah where we acknowledge the miracles of Hashem, Modim, where we say, that's where we have the Birchat Kohanim. What's the function of the Birchat Kohanim? When the Kohen gives the blessing to the Jews, what is he giving them? He's giving them the light of his kihuna. What he has, that's the blessing that he's giving to the Jews. What does he have? He has this power of Kohen, this power of super chesed, that Hashem has given him the power of blessing, that's what he's giving to the rest of the Jews. He's giving them this power of beracha, this chesed, to be able to receive this rov chesed, this rov shefa, which once they have that, they're able to have true charm, true chen in the eyes of Hashem. This is why we say in the berachat kohanim, the Gemara says, Yivarechecha Hashem. What is that? Bimamon, with money. May Hashem bless you with money. The next thing we say is, Yivishmerecha, may Hashem protect you from those who would try to damage you. This hints to these three wild animals who would try to damage the tefillah, or it hints to these chachmei hateva, who try to nullify the whole concept of praying. Why pray? Everything is predestined. It's all in stars. It's all governed by nature. There's nothing you can do about it. Vichuneka, what is Vichuneka? Once a person is okay to receive this blessing from Hashem, what does he have? He has chen by Hashem. He has a charm where Hashem is willing to do anything this person asks, Hashem is willing to grant him. If he has this kind of emunah. However, we should be zocher to start praying with kavanah, shachit bincha, abit with kavanah, and to keep the holidays the right way, and to be able to draw this full measure of fear of Hashem upon us, which can serve as a keli, into which Hashem can place this rov chesed, this extra large quantity of kindness, and we should be zocher, thereby with this kindness, to receive all the blessings of Hashem, baruch niyad begashmiyad, physical and spiritual, and especially get to see the coming of the Mashiach, the kinyin bet begashmiyad, the kinyin bet begashmiyad, the kinyin bet Um, how come before you said like the lion, the eagle, and the what was it? The lion.
lion, the eagle, and the ox. Um, well, anyway, how come on the lion and the... Well, I don't know about the eagle. How come the lion, like, it's not a kosher animal, but it represents, like, good? Right. The answer is that in, in this item specifically, it, in other words, you, you're asking how could the lion be a member of the throne of Hashem and yet be an unkosher animal? I don't know. I don't know the reason why. But in other words, here we're not talking about something necessarily edible. We're talking about the lion as being representative of strength, outstanding gevura, tremendous strength. In other words, it's being used in a different context. However, I'm sure that there is a reason. In other words, why it's, how it's possible that this could be referred to on one hand as an unkosher animal, and yet we say that this, its face appears on the television. Like what I mean is, like also, I keep the kosher animal being strong. Excuse me? Exactly. I understand what you're saying. The fact is that the strongest animal is the lion. No question about that. The question is, why isn't the lion, in other words, why couldn't Hashem make it kosher? In other words, if this is on the throne, and if it is the strongest, why isn't it kosher? I don't know. There must be reasons for this. Right. 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 But if we can treat it with the head and harm it, it will stand for the answer is that must have separate significance. It doesn't apply to these four Because the reason that says we don't follow the as the Because of the Right. However, in this context, when we say that our Tefillot correspond and our Mashlim, the Merkava Mashlim, it's these three basic Tefillot. On Yom Kippur, we have five Tefillot. How does that fit into this? The answer is that these three basic ones are the ones that correspond to these three Tefillot. The Shur was Yitzhak. Yes. The Shur represents Yitzhak. Why? Because Akedah. Okay, why was he replaced by the Shur, not by the Shur? Ah, ah, again, there are reasons. All of these things are reasons why this was picked not that. But yet we know that sure is something that could be, all the other ones, a lion or an eagle, cannot be brought on the Mizbech. The one animal that can be brought on the Mizbech is a shore. That's why that's the one of the three, the one that represents Yitzchak is sure. But it was replaced by the shore. No, he was replaced by him. That's a separate item. We say, we say that our stuck by davening. It's like in the middle of that of davening. Right. Also, complement exactly. This. Because this explains why the Shulchan Aruch says that before a person goes to pray, he should always give tzedakah. The pasuk says, "Vaniv b'tzedek er tzedakah." Why? Because that's one of the ingredients that's needed in being able to destroy this opposition. In other words, we know that there is opposition. No question at all. Oh, we forgot to mention why we read the Torah specifically on Monday and Thursday. Monday and Thursday, because those days are called Yemei Ratzon. Because our whole problem here is a conflict between the Apikures, between the philosopher, the scientist, who tries to show that everything is not within the Ratzon of Hashem, that everything is not within the control of Hashem, versus the Torah and the Tefillah, which show that we believe that everything is Beretzono. Everything is Beratzon Hashem. Is the market day, uh, Monday, Thursday? That's number one. But why? The why reason is, is exactly. The reason is because those were the days when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to heaven and brought down the Luchot, the second Luchot for the Jews, the final tablets that he brought down. The Gemara tells us, Tosafot in Baba Kama tells us that he went up on a Thursday and he came down on a Monday. And that's why the Midrash says that those two days are considered special. They're called Yemei Ratzon. Those were the days on which his mission, where Hashem accepted him, Hashem was Meratze, Nitratze, Hashem accepted him, those were, the mission began on a Thursday, ended on a Monday. That's why for all generations, those days are called Yemei Ratzon. So if we say that the function of the reading of the Torah is to help the Tefillah in giving power to this Ratzon versus the Apikursut, the belief in the fact that everything is Beratzon Hashem, that's why we read the Torah specifically on these days which are called Yemei Ratzon.
days of Ratzon. Because our whole battle here is the Metzach HaRatzon versus the Metzach HaNachash. It's the power of Ratzon, this faith in that everything is controlled by the will of Hashem versus Chas Veshem on the opposite. That's the reason for that. The Chorat Sofa HaVah was... Right. We were talking about the Shekhinah, but there's a Pasuk in Shira Shinim that says, Merkavo Argaman, that the throne of Hashem, the chariot of Hashem, is made of purple wool, which is a dark color. Dark represents always harshness, judging din. But the inside, the outside looks dark. The inside is lined with love. The symbol for love in the Torah is always white, chesed. White always represents kindness, chesed. So we were saying that this re- sorry. Excuse me. We were saying that this represents the Shekhinah. This what is the throne of Hashem? The Shekhinah. That's what's referred to as the throne of Hashem. <coughs> this Shekhinah on the outside, what we, we say that Shekhinah punishes. When the Jews are there, the Shekhinah punishes them or goes into exile with them. On the outside it looks like it's a power of judgment in the end. But the inside, it's just like a parent, a father, who has to show a strict face to his children in order to lead them in a proper way. But inside, he's full of love. 99% of his feelings are love towards them. He just has to put on, on the outside, a thin layer of looking strict. Otherwise, has shalom, they'll disrespect him, they'll disobey him. So the same thing is by the Shekhinah. So we mentioned that the basic name of the Shekhinah is Aleph Dalet Nun Yud, Adni. That's the name that we usually use to refer to the Shekhinah. And Adni is Milashon, the Gemara says Dina de Malchuta Dina. Dina means judgment, harshness. The word Aleph Dalet Nun Yud, the Arizal says, is the same letters as Dina. Din, judgment, harshness. That's the name of Hashem that represents the Shekhinah, this judgment. On the outside, it looks like Din. On the inside, the inside is lined with Chesed. Where do we see this? The Arizal says, if you'll study these Hebrew letters, Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud, you'll note that each one of these letters, when I say the letter Aleph, it's as though I said Aleph, Lamed, Pe, right? Lamed, it's as though I said Lamed, Mem, Dalet, right? Lamed, that's how it's pronounced. Dalet, it's as though I said Dalet, Lamed, Taf. Yud, it's as though I said Yud, Vav, Dalit, right? That's how it would be spelled. So the Arizal says this word, Aleph, Dalit, Nun, Yud, when we write it out, B'miloi, in its fullness, each one of the letters has three letters. Aleph is Aleph, Lamed, Pei, three letters. Lamed, Lamed, Mem, Dalit. Dalit, Dalit, Lamed, Taf, Yud, Yud, Vav, Dalit. Which means, whenever you have three, there's a center, there's a middle. We just said, Merkavo Argaman, the outside looks dark. Tocho Ratzu The inside, the center, is lined with love. The Arizal says, if you add up the middle letters here, Aleph, what's the middle letter? Aleph, Lamed, Pei, Lamed. Dalit, what's the middle letter? Again, Dalit, Dalit, Lamed, Taf. The middle letter is a Lamed. 30 and 30? Shishim. Nun. Nun, Vav, Nun. What's the middle letter? Vav. Yud. Yud, Vav, Dalit. What's the middle letter? Vav. How much is twice Vav? 12. 60 and 12? 72. Chesed. Chesed is Bigimatria 70. Chet is 8. The Arizal says this is the secret. Tocho Ratzuf Ava. If you study the name of Hashem that represents Din, Malchut, harshness, the inside is Chesed. This is the greatness of Hashem. Interesting. Has quoted from the Benish Chai who wrote many, many Sforim. And among in his forum, he quoted many, many stories in which he tried to bring out the Musa, things that people could learn from them, lessons that apply to people. And some of the stories that we're going to quote tonight are going to be from the forum of Rabbi Nuzal. One of the things that I had wanted to mention tonight, which interestingly, on the way here, this happened to come out in conversation in a car, 
is the fact that there was once an incident. We know many times there are many things that compete with a person's religious obligations. We know that the Torah says that there's a mitzvah of a higisabai yaimam volayla, that the obligation of a Jew to study Torah is a 24-hour-a-day obligation. The only time that a Jew is exempt from the study of Torah is if a person could find a unit of time that's not within day and it's not within night, at that point in time a person has an exemption. Other than that, there is no time whatsoever that's exempt from the study of Torah or from serving Hashem in some way. It's understood that there's a time for learning, there's a time for davening, there's a time for every single aspect of serving Hashem. And we know that the Gemara in many places gets very technical to know the halacha. What's the, what's the, what's the law? What does Hashem say a person should do if there's a conflict between two mitzvahs? A person has a choice of learning Torah or attending a funeral learning Torah or going to a wedding, different items like that, in which the Gemara gives a very clear technical answer that's brought in Shulchan Aruch to know what the law is. And these items each and every person has to study to be able to know how to allocate their time. Each and every one of us is zeicha to have 24 hours in a day to play with that are allocated to us. And chas v'shalom, any time that's misused or any time that's not invested properly, just like lahavdal, when we speak about gashmias, a person wants to invest in a CD or in a stock or in a store or in a merchandise, he, before he invests, before he opens the investment, he's going to try to research to find out which investment is considered the best, which one is going to bring the highest dividends, long-term, short-term gains, all the different benefits that could be gotten. So too, Lahavtal, when it comes to Kiddusha, when a person wants to invest in a mitzvah, certainly, how much more so, a person would want to know where do I get the maximum earnings. I want to do that which will please Hashem the most. And therefore, a person wants to know exactly what Hashem prefers. Now, unfortunately, many times a person has different obligations that come up, whether it be responsibilities, a person has responsibilities to their family, they have to earn a livelihood, and that takes up eight or ten hours a day, right off the bat. And if a person stops to think about all the different things that are competing with a person's religious obligations, it becomes a person's running a very, very tight show in just trying to steal two, three, four hours a day for Hashem, even that's difficult. So at least those two, three, four hours that are available, a person has to maximize, use them to the best of their ability. Now, just to illustrate an example of the importance of how to deal with this situation, we find that Rav Zal, who was the closest student of Rav Zal, after Rabbi Nezal's passing, <coughs> he had students of his own, he gave shiurim, and he taught Torah, he spread Torah in the world, he spread the light of Rabbi Nezal in the world. We know Rabbi Nezal brings on the Allah Chais that the, the most important time of the year, we've mentioned this time and time again, the most important time of the week is Shabbos, the most important day of the week is Shabbos, and on Shabbos itself, the most important time of day is Mincha time. Towards evening, as the Shabbos is coming to a close, that's considered the holiest time of Shabbos. And all the tzaddikim of previous generations, whenever they would want to give a shear, the most important shear of the week, was usually given on that, at that time, Shabbat at Mincha. We find that one time there was an incident that Rabbi Natanzal used to give a shear also at Shabbat at Mincha. And one time, one of his students, one of his regulars, one of those who used to come to the shiur every week, one week he was absent. So that the next week when he came to the shiur, Rabbi Natanzal asked him, what happened to you? Where were you last week? He asked him just to, to know for curiosity. So the student mentioned, not in, a, not in a, an emphatic way, just telling a fact, that what happened was that that Shabbat was the Sheva Berachot of his sister, his sister had gotten married the week before, and on Shabbat they had Sheva Berachot, which is a special party that's made during the seven days following, including the wedding day. And obviously that, that in itself is a mitzvah, to attend a seudat mitzvah, number one, plus the fact that this was a family obligation. And this is the manner in which the student was presenting this. He wanted to make Rabbi Natanzal aware that this was a fa there was a family obligation that came up that he had to attend. Rabbi Natanzal was quiet. 
and his silence seemed to show a drop of disapproval, that he wasn't necessarily in agreement with what the student had said. So one of the students, one of the sharper students who was sitting there at the time that this incident happened, he looked at Rabbi Natanzal's face, studied it, and he knew that something should be said. So he thought for a second, and he piped up in a singing voice, he quoted the pasuk that says, Emor la chokma achoti at. Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon says, that a Jew should say about wisdom, about the Torah, a person should have such a close relationship with the Torah that it should be as close to him as a sister. As well as a person knows his own sister, how? Because he lives with her, he's, he spends the first 20, 30 years of his life or his whole life with her, that's how well acquainted a Jew should try to get himself with the Torah. So this student piped up, if you think that you had a family obligation to your sister to go to her Sheva Berachot, this was also your sister. When Rabbi Natanza was giving a shiur in Torah, the Torah is also called a person's sister. And with this, he wanted to underline, he wanted to accentuate the importance, how unfortunately people many times make a mistake they don't realize the importance of a shiur kavua in Torah. We find the Zohar Kadosh in one place says, this Rabbein Azal references in a story in Sipur Masiot. In one of the stories there, Rabbein Azal speaks about a king and about the fact that this king was having tremendous problems and there was one thing that protected him. There was a book that he had and he was told that the page of the book is going to protect him. That's what's going to help him and protect him. And I once heard that Rebel Yochaim Shlita the Rosh bias of the world, the leading tzaddik emet, he once mentioned about this story that what Rabbi Nezal is referring to here is the statement in the Zohar Kadosh, where the Zohar Kadosh says that there are certain kilipot that try to work against the person every single day, chas v'shalom, trying to destroy him, trying to destroy his closeness with Hashem. And the Zohar Kadosh says that for these specific, for this unit of klipot, for this unit of tum'ah, the only way that a person can deal with it is by having a shiur kavua in Torah. If a person has a set time every single day when he studies Torah and he keeps that very, very holy, that's what protects the person from this unit of klipot that would chas v'shalom want to damage, want to challenge, want to threaten a person's relationship with Hashem. This pasuk, the fact is that the regular pshat of this pasuk is that the Gemara says that a Jew should be careful when teaching Torah to others. If a person ever wants to teach Torah to others, a person should make sure that the Torah is as clear to him, that his knowledge of what he wants to present is as clear to him as the knowledge of his sister. That's when he's permitted to speak words of Torah. Otherwise, if a person isn't really knowledgeable or he's not really confident, totally sure of what he's saying, the Gemara will warns he should wait until he becomes more knowledgeable before he achieve, before he attempts to teach Torah to other people. One other story that I want to mention now, which again is written, these stories are written down in the Sefer Koch Ve'or. The words Koch Ve'or means stars of light. And this refers to the luminaries, the great luminaries, the outstanding students of Rabbi Nezal, one of Rabbi Nezal's followers, Rabbi Avraham Rabbi, Rabbi Nachman, the Birli Kutim Zal, gathered together from his, the knowledge that he had and the information that he had speaking to students of Rabbi Nezal, Rabbi Natan Zal, he gathered together many, many stories about Rabbi Nezal and his students, about Rabbi Natan Zal and his students, and these stories were put down on paper, were written in this sefer to teach us many, many lessons in knowing about how a person could be zocher to come close to Rabbi Nezal. One of Rabbi Nezal's students was a certain Rabbi Yitzchak, who lived in a village called Khar Shevita. <coughs> and this student, Rabbi Nezal, liked him very much. At one point in time, Rabbi, Natanz, Rabbi Nezal was traveling in a coach with his students, and they passed by a certain village that was on the outskirts of the city, <coughs> and this, on, in the, on the road, as they were traveling, they noticed a young a boy, about 20, 21 years old, on the road. Now, this boy was the brother of one of Rabbi Nezal's students, this Rabbi Yitzchak Zal, who we mentioned. This boy was his brother, and he had just gotten married about a year before that, about a year before this story took place. 
he had gotten married and his father-in-law had taken him as his son-in-law because he heard that he was a Talmud Chacham. He wanted to have a son-in-law whom he could support. He, his father-in-law was wealthy enough to be able to support him where he didn't have to earn a livelihood on his own. And he took this person as a son-in-law with the hope that he would spend his time in Torah and serving Hashem. And this is what he would have for his daughter. This is what he wanted his daughter to have as a husband. Unfortunately, this couple, this young couple, moved. The place where they lived was not within the city limits. It was sort of outside the city. <clears throat> and the place where he lived, he didn't have any friends, any religious friends, close friends, to influence him, to be in a circle constantly with people who are speaking about religion and talking about being religious. And this obviously had an effect on him so that he began to become, so he began to slacken off in his study and many times he would wander outside the house right outside of where he lived there was a blacksmith who worked in building all kinds of machinery different things with metal and this would fascinate him many times and captivate him for hours sometimes he'd go out of the house and again because he didn't have a job it wasn't like he had to earn a livelihood he had the time on his hands he would become involved in watching this blacksmith at times or at other times, he would watch the fishermen, fascinated sometimes by the way they went about their procedures of preparing nets to catch fish and the different fish that they would catch. And this began to occupy a lot of his time. He would spend a lot of time sitting, watching the blacksmith, watching the fishing, and naturally wasting this time, not using this time for the study of Torah. One time, Rabbi Nezah was traveling in a wagon with his students, <coughs> and he traveled the wagon went by the place where this this rabbi this one who was originally a rabbi was sitting on the road and he was sitting without the menhag in those days was that a rabbi always wore a long coat he was never seen walking in short sleeves that type of dress this boy though because of the fact that he was outside in this type of atmosphere he wasn't wearing a jacket he was wearing a short sleeve shirt and just sitting there on the road watching the fishing and watching the blacksmith just as Rabbi Nezah was coming by. Now he noticed this wagon coming up the road, and he saw that there were people hanging from the entrance to the wagon. Look, It looked as though they were listening very intently to what somebody seated inside the wagon was saying. So he was able to see at a distance that there must be some great rabbi in this wagon, and the ones who are hanging on are his students who are listening to what he's saying. So he felt very embarrassed to be caught out here like this without his jacket and to be caught just watching the fishermen. So he tried to make a beeline for the house. He tried to head for the house and to get there before he would be noticed by the people in this wagon, just in case they were people who knew him. But Rav Enezal noticed him, and Rav Enezal told the wagon driver, go, go off the road and get him, catch him, catch up to him. <clears throat> And Rabbi Nezal stopped the wagon by him and he motioned for him to come in, that he wanted to speak to him. And Rabbi Nezal said to him, Don't I recognize you? Aren't you the brother of my student, Rabbi Yitzchak? And Rabbi Nezal told him, he asked him, What are you doing now? So he told him, Well, I'm in between learning. I was learning in the morning. And I, he started trying to make explanations to Rabbi Nezal. And obviously, Rabbi Nezal was able to see exactly where this person was holding in religion, and Rabbi Nezal began to reprimand him. And he began to ask him, he began to tell him, don't you know that the only reason why your father-in-law accepted you as his son-in-law was because of the respect that he had for you? He saw that you were a Tamil Chacham. He thought he was buying something with his money. He invested in you. He agreed to give you so much of a dowry, so much money to live on, but it was on the assumption that you would be very, that you would be a Talmud Chacham and conduct yourself as a Talmud Chacham, not for this. And Rav Enezal began speaking to him very warmly to the point where he broke down crying. Rav Enezal's words were so penetrating to his heart that he started crying in front of Rav Enezal because he realized, he was made to realize that he had fallen into a rut where he had let days and weeks go by. Here's a person who was used to the study of Torah coming to learning and attending classes in Torah on a regular basis, and here he let himself slide to such an extent, he started feeling so terrible about this that he started crying in front of Rabbi Nezal, and he told Rabbi Nezal that I accept it from here on in. I'm going to go back to learning much, much better than I was doing before. 
Rabbi Nezal told him, listen to me, I want you to know that if you want to really advance, try to come to the shooting that we have also, and especially the most important time to make sure to come to me is Rosh Hashanah. That's the most important time of the year when all my students come to me <coughs> and try, I know that there might be obstacles that will rise up to block you from coming to me, but make sure that you do everything in your power to be Zohar to come to me for Rosh Hashanah. This student did this, and he became, he started going back to learning with much more hatmada, much more vigor and energy than he was doing even when he was at his best before. And sure enough, as soon as Rosh Hashanah came, he set out to go to be with Rabbi Nezal for Rosh Hashanah. At this point in Rabbi Nezal's life, for a short period of time, Rabbi Nezal allowed his students, he permitted his students, to have vidui dvarim before him. We know that the Torah says, <coughs> the Pasuk says, Kru imachem dvarim v'shuvu el Hashem. Contrary to popular opinion, the Goyim think that the concept of confession is a concept with a, is a concept which originates from their religion, Chas v'shalom. But this concept comes from the Torah. The Torah speaks about how important it is that the Gemara says that in most cases, when a Jew commits a sin, especially if it's between if it's between himself and his fellow man, if he took money that he shouldn't have, or if he said something that he shouldn't have, he can correct it by going over to the other person and apologizing or returning the money or trying to correct the situation. Whereas when a person commits a sin against Hashem, chas v'shalom, a person wastes time that they could have used for the study of Torah, for doing mitzvot, or a person eats something they weren't permitted to, that type of sin, it's almost impossible to retract, to retract the sin. However, the Gemara says that Hashem says, how does a person erase a sin like that completely? The answer is, Kru imachem divarim. Hashem says, I want your words. If a Jew comes to Hashem and apologizes with full sincerity for any sin that he did or for any number of sins that the person could have committed, be it a thousand, be it a million, if the apology is said with sincerity and the person accepts upon themselves not to repeat the sin, the apology alone, the words alone, are enough to remove the sin completely, as though it never happened. And the Rabbein Azal, in one chapter in Likutei Moharan, in the first half of Likutei Moharan, chapter 4, Rabbein Azal explains that this does not only apply when a person has confession before Hashem, but there is also a concept of confessing one's sins before a tzaddik emet, before the greatest tzaddik of the generation, and that a person doing this, a person confessing his sins before a tzaddik emet, that has the power to forgive, to have the sins forgiven completely. Now, there are certain stories in the Midrash and the Gemara which illustrate this point, where a person came before a great rabbi and he was shown that he had done many things wrong, and he confessed his sins, and they were forgiven. He confessed before a rabbi. And Rabbi Nezal, in this chapter of Likutei Muharam that we just referenced, Rabbi Nezal explains the secret of how this works, and why, and why it should be said before a tzaddik. But in any case, Rabbi Nezal, for a short period of time, allowed his students to come before him, specifically on Erev Rosh Hashanah, and to confess their sins. Now, naturally, when they did this, a person coming into the presence of a great tzaddik, if he attempts to confess his sin, automatically, he's going to be filled with a, an incredible embarrassment. Because of the fact that they were standing before Rabbi Nezal, this holiest tzaddik, they were filled with a tremendous embarrassment at the time, and many of them would break down crying before Rabbi Nezal. So this student, whom we just mentioned, whom Rabbi Nezal told to come to him for Rosh Hashanah, he came, he showed up at Rabbi Nezal's home on Erev Rosh Hashanah, and when he came into the house, he sat down on, by the doorstep to rest for a minute before going inside, and he dozed off just from the tiredness of the trip. As he woke up from his dozing, he noticed people coming out of Rabbi Nezal's room with their faces red and tears loaded. They see, saw their faces were wet, soaked from tears, from crying. And immediately he got filled with a tremendous fear. He became very much afraid to go into Rabbi Nezal, but he knew that once he was here, there was no way in the world he could, come, he could, he could spend Rosh Hashanah with Rabbi Nezal without having come in before to see him, to speak to him. 
So sure enough, when his turn came, he went. He entered the room that Rabbi Nezal was sitting in, and Rabbi Nezal said to him, Speak, tell me what your problems are. So this student got quiet, he froze, and he said, uh, Nothing much, nothing I can think of offhand. I can't think of any sins that I committed offhand. Rabbi Nezal looked at him angrily and said, Who are you going to fool? I'm telling you, tell me what you know and what I know. Not, you're not going to tell me anything new. Tell me what I already know. And this student still kept hemming and hawing, and he, he avoided saying, he avoided confessing his sins before Rabbi Nezal. What happened was Rabbi Nezal saw that he kept doing this, and Rabbi Nezal pushed him sort of out of the room, not, not a, a forced push, but he motioned him out of the room, and he sort of gave him like a gentle slap on his face, on his nose, a motion, okay, if, if that's how you feel, then, then go. Rabbi Nezal motioned him out of the room, and he stayed that Rosh Hashanah, he prayed with Rabbi Nezal's minyan, but right after Rosh Hashanah, he stopped coming to Rabbi Nezal. And this continued for a number of years. For the next two or three years, he refused to come because he felt that he had been insulted, he had been reprimanded in this way, he didn't want to accept it. About three years later, Rabbi Natanza writes, this student decided to make an attempt again. He saw that years were going by, and factually he was missing out. He saw his friends advancing much quicker than him in Torah, in, in, in serving Hashem. He decided to make another attempt at coming to Rabbi Nezal to see if he, could, if he could benefit from the teachings of Rabbi Nezal. So he came to a shiur that Rabbi Nezal was giving, and here again, for the second time, when this person came into the room, the room Rabbi Nezal looked at him, and Rabbi Nezal made some type of a light joke about this person, about the fact that, oh, now he's coming, he hasn't been here for a long time, and Rabbi Nezal worded this in a joking manner, and the people in the room cracked up. They laughed just at the joke, not in an insulting way, but just because Rabbi Nezal made some type of a funny remark about this student. This student, again, felt insulted. He felt that Rabbi Nezal was pushing him here. Here he finally was willing to make an attempt to come close to Rabbi Nezal. Rabbi Nezal was pushing him away. So he left and he did not come back. Until Rabbi Nezal's passing, this student never made an appearance again before Rabbi Nezal. A few years after Rabbi Nezal had passed away, this boy mentioned to one of Rabbi Nezal's students, whose name was Rabbi Meir, Mi Teplik, Rabbi Meir from the city of Teplik, he mentioned to him that I know that your rabbi, I know that Rabbi Nezal was a very big tzaddik, but I tried to come to him a few times and he insulted me, so I, I decided not to come. So this Rabbi Meir looked at him shocked, and he said to him, such a rabbi, from what, for what you were able to get from him, if he would use you as a doorstep, if he would use you as a doormat, it still would have been worthwhile for you to come and to get everything that could have been gotten from so great a rabbi. And this was the comment that he made from him, because we find the Gemara says in many places, the Gemara says that any Talmud Chacham who is not nokim venoter kenachash, who doesn't at times reprimand a student as a snake, the wording that's used in the Gemara is avenge, revenge, chas v'shalom, that there are times that a person has to be reprimanded if they're doing something that's not correct, the person has to be told, otherwise they don't know. The Pasuk says, Hocheach tocheach et amitecha velo tisa alav chet. Chas v'shalom, if a person sees another Jew doing something incorrect and he doesn't notify the person, if he knows that this person is such a type of person, who's not interested in being told, who, if you tell him what's right, he's not going to listen, he's going to disobey, then it's understood the rabbi has to know that this is not a person whom you can reprimand. This person is not interested in learning. You can't teach him. You can't force him. The fact is that every person has free choice. But if he considers the student to be one who is interested in learning, who is interested in coming close to Hashem, and a rabbi sees something that could be improved, that could be bettered, 
then obviously it's the responsibility of the rabbi to spend the time and the effort in notifying the student about this and in trying to coerce him to improve him. And if he doesn't, chas v'shalom, the Torah tells us that who are the ones who are responsible? Who are the ones who are held responsible for the sins of the Jewish people? It's not the people, it's the leaders, it's the rabbis. We mentioned this once before, but it pays to mention this, number one, for the Zechut of the Tzadik, who mentioned this item to us, Reb Kalman, Shlita, one of the leading Tzadikim in Eretz Yisrael, once mentioned to us, we find that there's one place in the Torah, we find throughout the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu is always defending the Jews. You never, ever find the case of Moshe Rabbeinu saying something nasty about the Jewish people. Even at the time that the Jews fell to the lowest level of all time, when the Jews participated in the sin of the golden calf, chas v'shalom, rachmon al-itzlon, which was an item that angered Hashem to the greatest extent, even then Moshe Rabbeinu tried to see the good in them and tried to defend them before Hashem to the utmost until he actually succeeded in saving their lives. We find one place in the Torah where the Jews were doing something that angered Moshe Rabbeinu, and Moshe Rabbeinu said to them, Mamrim heitem, you're a nation of rebels, you're a bunch of rebels, miyondati etchem. From the time that I first knew you, you're a bunch of rebels, you're a bunch of no goodniks, and there's nothing I can do about it. This is the comment that Moshe Rabbeinu made. And any person studying this, this doesn't seem to coincide with the attitude that we find in all other places that Moshe Rabbeinu shows, and with the attitude that the Torah tells us that a true tzaddik is supposed to show. A true tzaddik is one who never, never judged the Jewish nation as being totally bad. He would always look to find something good in them. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu make this comment? And Reb Kalman mentioned it. One of the Mefarashim points out, note the wording of Moshe Rabbeinu. He said, Mamrim heitem, you're a bunch of rebels. Miyom dati etchem, from when I first knew you. Meaning, why, why did he mention those words? Why did he tack on those words? He wanted to imply that he was considering himself as guilty. From when have you been rebels? From when I knew you, me implying. From the time that I took over as leader, that's up until then, possibly the Jews were good, they were religious. It's from the time that I took over that I see that the people are a bunch of rebels, showing, acknowledging that who is responsible, not chas v'shalom, that Moshe Rabbeinu was holding the Jews responsible, he was placing the burden of responsibility upon himself. Because this is always the case, we find the Torah tells us always that whenever Hashem chas v'shalom, gets angry at the Jewish nation, who does he let it out on? On the leaders. The leaders are the ones that are responsible for the people. Therefore, one of the main functions of a rabbi, of one who is going to teach Torah, is that wherever there is an opening, if he sees a student who's interested in advancing and coming close to Hashem, then he's responsible to do everything in his power to show him the correct path. And at times, if that involves having to reprimand him, again, to try to do that within the confines of what the Torah prescribes. If the Torah says to do it with harshness, to do it with harshness. If the Torah says to coat it with sugar, a person has to conform with what the Torah says. We find the Mepharashim point out that Rabbein Azal says in Sefer Hamidot, Rabbein Azal brings in one place, that if a person tries to bring someone close to Hashem, and the person refuses the advances of the person, in other words, a person speaks to another person once, twice, and tries to influence him to come close to Hashem, and the person is misarev, Rabbein Azal says in Sefer Hamidot that then it's permissible to push him away with both hands. We find the Gemara warns in many places that a Jew has to be very, very careful that even if a student does something that's wrong, always at, at most to push him away with one hand, never with both hands. To always try to leave a door open for the student to be able to come back and make Teshubah. And the Gemara says that Elisha Hanavi, as great a tzaddik as he was, he had a student who did something that was very, very bad, and because of the fact that Elisha Hanavi, who was the rabbi, pushed his student away with both hands, he was punished for this. And yet we find that Rabbi Nezal says in Sefer Hamidot that there is an exception to this rule, that this rule is not unilateral, it's not across the board. Rabbi Nezal says very clearly that if 
a person attempts to bring a student close <coughs> and the student refuses, then the rabbi is permitted to push him away with both hands. And the Bir Likutim Zal says that this is obviously the policy that the Rabbein Zal followed with this individual. Because this boy, Rabbein Zal, had spent a lot of time with him, trying to teach him about Torah, trying to teach him about, trying to inspire him, to inject into him a fire for religion. And if after all of that, when the time came for a small test, this student failed. At that point in time, Rabbein Azal felt that it was permissible and it was obligatory for him to push this student away. Now note, even if the rabbi pushes the student away, the student is still obligated to do everything in his power to come back. The Gemara says that one rabbi once heard a voice, a heavenly voice, say that any other person can make Teshubah, any person other than yourself. And the commentaries tell us, what should this rabbi have done? He should have ignored, even if Hashem tells a person that you cannot make Teshubah, this is the one case that a Jew is not even obligated to obey Hashem. There's a Gemara that says that when a person, when a host, invites a guest into his home, the guest is obligated to listen, to adhere to everything that the host commands, except if the host says, get out, that the guest is not obligated to listen to. Why? Because if you invited me into your home, I'm staying now until I'm ready to leave. If you thought that I was a guest that you shouldn't have invited, you, should have, you shouldn't have invited me to begin with. Once you invited me, I'm permitted to stay whatever I think is a decent amount of time. <clears throat> the normal stay. So the Mepharashim point out that this Gemara can also be applied to Hashem. Hashem is referred to as the host of the world. Hashem is the Balabai of the world, and we are all the guests of Hashem in a sense. If Hashem ever tells any one of us, get out, that's the one command that a Jew is not obligated to obey the host. Even if Hashem says get out, a Jew is responsible to stay and to make every attempt within his power to Teshubah, for getting back into the good graces of Hashem. <coughs> We find in many cases, the Gemara tells us that as much as it's advisable for a person to speak when he feels he has something good to say, when he has something intelligent to say, so too it's very important for a person to know when not to speak, when to avoid speaking. Otherwise, in many cases, sometimes by a person speaking, people realize how little this person has to say. They, be, they, they find out how, how far this person is from having what something worthy of being said. <coughs> the Ben Ishchai, who was one of the leading tzaddikim among the Sefaradim, <coughs> told over many stories from the Midrash, from Sifre Musar, to, to inspire his students into coming close to Hashem. One of the stories that the Ben Ishchai brings in his Sefarim <coughs> relates to a person, a wealthy man, who lived on the, in, in a, in the, in the outskirts of the city, he had he owned fields and vineyards. That's that's from what his wealth was from, and he was religious to the point that generally he did not pray with a minyan. He prayed at home because he lived so far from the city. But there was one time a year that he kept he stuck to that regardless of anything he would always come into the big city to pray with the minyan, and that was when he had the yard site of his father. On the day of the passing of his father, he always made it his business to come to the city to pray with the minyan, to say the Kaddish, etc. <clears throat> One year, when this yard site came out on Shabbat, he made it his business naturally to come into the city out of Shabbat and to make arrangements to be able to stay over in an inn all the Shabbat so as to be able to keep the yard site of his father. Yard site is the Yiddish word meaning a year's time. Every the birth date of a person into Olam Haba. When a person passes away, the day that they're born into Olam Haba, that's called the yard site. <coughs> So this person on Erev Shabbat came into the city, and he was a very wealthy person, and he was obviously one who enjoyed kavod. Because of the fact that he was so wealthy, he liked when people felt, when people looked up to him, people spoke about him very respectfully. So he decided that if he's going to be in shul on Shabbat, on Shabbat all the be shul is filled with many, many people, he would like to be given a seat up front next to where the rabbi sits, so that people could see that he is a very respectable person, a very learned person, although this was very far from being the case. 
So this person went over to the shamas, the shamash of the shul, before Shabbat, and he told him, listen, I'm willing to give you a donation, $30, $40, $50 for the shul, if you prepare for me a seat, is there any way that you could put me up front where the respectable people sit? I, I'd like to have that honor, that kavod. So this shamash told him, fine, there is a seat very close to where the rabbi sits, <coughs> and the person who usually sits there is away for this for a week or two now. He's, he's out of the city. So I'll show you, I'll point that seat out to you. That's where you can sit throughout the Shabbat. This wealthy man went over to that seat on Friday night. He sat there, and he was sitting there. He was sitting so close to the rabbi of the shul, and he felt at a loss. He had nothing to say. And he felt that all eyes of the people were looking at him, looking at a person who's sitting so close to the rabbi, and watching him to see if he would engage the rabbi in any conversation. Then they would know he's an intelligent person, he's a learned person. Otherwise, just sitting there having nothing to say, it came out being an embarrassment to him. So he decided he can't have this, so he spent the Friday night, as soon as he came to the inn that he was staying at, he ate his meal, and he took out the Sidur trying to study. He decided he couldn't, he wasn't, he didn't have any knowledge of the study of Torah, but he did know, he did understand the translation of the words of Tefillah, the words of Shachrit Mecha Arbit, he knew what the words meant. <coughs> So he decided he's going to research those words very carefully to see if he could find some deep question in these words that he could present to the rabbi and present this in front of the people. In other words, mention this question out loud so that the people would hear him ask this question and they would see how smart, how learned they would, they would come off with an impression that he's a very learned person. So he spent two, three hours Friday night looking over the whole shachrit and he couldn't find anything that was a question. So the next morning he came to shul, he sat through the whole shachrit and the reading of the Torah, he had nothing to say, and he felt the tension building. He kept, he had this, this <clears throat> self-centered feeling, this, this con self-consciousness, as though everybody is watching him and they're just making a point of noticing the fact that he has nothing to say whatsoever. Then right after the meal, he, he went home after Shachrit, after Musaf, he ate and sat down again trying to study the, the Mincha, the Mincha of Shabbat, hoping that when he would come to Shul for Mincha, at least there he would find something, some deep question to be able to ask the rabbi to impress the people. And sure enough, after many hours, he found one item that looked like a big a big, a very deep question, that there must be some fantastic answer for this question. In the Mincha that we say on Shabbat, there is a short paragraph that we say after the Amidah, where we say Tzidkotcha, Tzidkotcha, three times. We say three sentences of the Navi, which begin with the words Tzidkotcha. The reason for these three sentences is because of the fact that three of the leading tzadikim of the Jewish people, Moshe Rabbeinu, Yosef HaTzadik and David HaMelech all passed away on Shabbat at Mincha, the Gemara tells us, because of the fact that these three great tzadikim passed away at that time, we commemorate their passing with these three sentences. Each one of these three sentences corresponds to one of these three tzadikim. In one of these sentences, we find the words, Adam ubehema Toshia Hashem. Hashem helps humans and animals. And the, the word human and animal are placed side by side. Human and animal, Hashem helps. Adam ubehema toshia Hashem. This person was looking at these words, and he said, there must be, this, this is a very difficult point. Why would, he, why would the Torah place the word Adam and behema side by side in this manner? In a man, when these two are so far apart, the human being and an animal is nothing similar about them. They're as far apart as you could possibly get. Why would we mention this sentence? Why would, the, why would it be worded in this way? There should be some type of a divider between the word Adam and the word Behemah. So this, he felt, was a deep question. And sure enough, 
he waited, he timed this just right. He waited till most of the people had come to the shul for Mincha. Just as the Chazan was about to begin praying, he spoke out in a loud voice to the rabbi, and he said, Rabbi, I've been studying Torah throughout the whole Shabbat, <coughs> and I've been delving into the depth of the words of the tefillah that we say, and this, I've come up with a point that bothers me. I'm sure there must be a very profound answer to this question. My question is that in the Mincha that we're about to pray, we have the words Adam or Behemat Toshia Hashem. Why is it that the word, the, the Adam is placed right next to the Behemah when these two don't belong right next to each other? This should be some type of divider. Who placed, who did this and for what reason? Who placed the Adam next to the Behemah? The rabbi looked at him, and this rabbi was obviously one with a quipped tongue. The rabbi said to him, the shamash. The shamash is the one who t put an adam next to a behemah. He put me next to you. What's the shamash? The, the one, the person who, who, the gabai, the one who gave him that seat. The man who had shown oh. him where to sit, to tell this person to sit right next to the rabbi. He said the shamash is the one that did this, and if you want to know why he did it, I don't know. Now picture this man asked the question in a way to attract the attention of all the people in the Knis. They were all listening to this, and they all heard the rabbi's answer. They all broke out in hysterical laughter, because they all knew that this was a ridiculous question. In other words, these are the words of the tefillah. This person thought that this was such a profound question. This was a silly question. And this person didn't understand what he meant. The, you know, he thought, he's still thinking that this was a deep question. He couldn't understand what the rabbi was implying. All the rabbi said was the shamash. The other people who were standing around, they understood, they took the hint that what the rabbi meant was the fact that he seated me next to you. This person didn't understand this, but he saw the people break out in laughter, and he felt that they were not laughing with him, they were laughing at him, so he felt embarrassed, and right after Shabbat, he quickly went over to the Shamash, and he said to him, could you explain what happened? Why did, you know, what, what did the rabbi mean when he said the Shamash? So this, the Shamash explained to him that what the rabbi meant was that in seating you next to he was referring to you as a behemah, that your lack of knowledge of Torah and everything, that you took a seat that obviously wasn't fitting for you, and you attempted to present yourself as a Talmud Chacham, and you're obviously very far from this. This wealthy man was very embarrassed. He felt very hurt at this and very embarrassed. And he said to the Shamash, listen, I'm very rich. I'm willing to give you a thousand dollars cash if you can just give me something to say now. In other words, now my, my dignity has been lowered in front of the whole Knis. I want to go back there and be able to say something that will restore my dignity, my pride. I've been embarrassed in front of the whole shul. And regardless of what I did, if he's a rabbi, he shouldn't have insulted me in this way in front of all the people. Could you give me some type of thing? The Shamash said, fine. This Shamash was obviously learned in Torah. And he thought for a minute, and he said, what you have to do is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a speech, and you have a whole week to prepare it. You, in other words, this person was obviously not learned in Torah, so he told him, you're going to have to keep reviewing this every day of the week so that it can come out smooth next Shabbat. When they gather together again for Mincha, you'll get up and you'll say this speech that I'm giving you now to prepare, and in this way you'll be able to clean up the, the mess that you made this past Shabbat. He told them, listen very carefully. What, what this, what, the question is, why in fact are these two words, is this sentence written this way? You'll have to explain to the rabbi and the people that what you meant to ask was that the pasuk should have said, Adam Toshia Hashem, or Behema Toshia Hashem. The pasuk should have said that Hashem helps humans and Hashem helps animals. But why is the word Adam put right next to Behema? There must be a significance in that. <clears throat> and you'll tell them that you thought about this and you came up with a very deep answer as to what this refers to. We know that in a human being, in a Jew, there are two parts. There's the Neshama, there's the spiritual part of the person, the part that comes from Hashem, and there's the Guf, the body, <clears throat> the physical matter. We know that in many places in the Gemara, the Gemara refers to the goof, the physical body, as the animalistic part of the person. That there is a humanistic part of the person, which is the spiritualism of the person, the neshama. That's what we call Adam. When we use the word Adam, we refer to the kidusha, the holiness. <clears throat> Whereas when we use the word behema about a person, what we're implying is that he's a very mundane type of 
person. He's into he's into the physical world. We call him a behema, a person who's into eating and sleeping and working. <coughs> and there's nothing intel there's nothing religious about him. He's not involved in the study of Torah, that type of thing. Now the question is, why does the Pasuk say Adam u Behema Toshia Hashem? Because the neshama, as great as it is, <coughs> as holy as it is, when the neshama is in heaven, we don't see the real beauty of the neshama. Why? Because in heaven you have angels, you have malachim, you have spiritual worlds and everything. A Jewish neshama is another spiritual item there. We don't really see the beauty of it. It's only when Hashem takes a neshama and sends it down to this world and places it within a body, within a physical body that's very, very far from anything spiritual. And the neshama functions within a body. And these two unite to serve Hashem. That's when the beauty of the neshama is brought out. That when the neshama, that's when the neshama really shows itself. Just like when a person has an article of jewelry or an expensive item and they want to show the beauty of it by just presenting it like this, just showing the object itself, you don't really see it. It's when it's put on a showcase and the showcase is designed in such a way to contrast the item that's when the item really comes out looking good, and a person, a good salesman, can use that as a selling point, can take an item that's worth $10 and sell it for 100 just by presenting it with the proper background, with the proper contrast to it, he can really make it come off looking very, very good. <coughs> so this is the interpretation when the Pasuk says, Adam, u behema, toshia Hashem, what the Pasuk means, Adam, veneshama. When the neshama is placed within a body, that's something that makes Hashem so happy and it has such a beauty to it that Toshia Hashem, that Hashem helps and Hashem is very proud of, etc. This is the speech that this shamash prepared for this person. And sure enough, the next week he came into the shul and he got up and he mentioned this whole item to the rabbi and the people were very impressed by this. In doing this, in doing this, he was able to correct the embarrassment that he suffered the week before in speaking when he shouldn't have spoken. Number one, the week before he was speaking from his own intellect, which was obviously very lacking, and a person like that, the advice that the Torah gives to him, if a person knows, if a person is not sure that he has something intelligent to say, better not to say it. The Gemara says, Mili b'sela mashtuka b'tren, that if, if words are worth a dollar, and then silence is worth two dollars. And what does this refer to? This refers to a person <coughs> who has nothing good to say. Obviously, if there's a choice between him speaking or not speaking, the silence is worth more than the actual words. Whereas if a person is zocheh, that he does have what to say, he has words of Torah to speak, or items that can help another person, there certainly we say not to hold back. There it's a mitzvah to speak. So the Ben Chai says in this story we see these two points being brought out so clearly. How a person can embarrass himself at times, bring embarrassment, bring shame upon himself by speaking when, he, when it's not, when he doesn't have what to say, and how it's possible for a person who's very, very far from knowledge by simply humbling himself and coming close to someone who is knowledgeable, in this case the Shamash was able to prepare for him something to say which when he presented the words of the Shamash, he was able to come off looking respectable and being able to correct the embarrassment, the shame that he had felt the week before. One other case to show the intellect <coughs> of the Jewish people, especially the Gemara tells us <coughs> that it's those people that are poor, that in many cases, because of the fact that they have a broken heart, they're very close to Hashem, and therefore a Jew should be very, very careful about their feelings, about the feelings of a poor man, because Hashem is nothing that Hashem loves more. The Pasuk says, Zivche Elokim Ruach Nishbara. The Pasuk, the Gemara says that a Jew who comes to pray before Hashem with a broken heart, that has more favor in Hashem's eyes, not just than one Korban. If a Jew wanted to bring a sacrifice in the Beit HaMikdash, a sacrifice, an ox, could cost a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, a big, a huge ox. The Gemara says that a Jew who comes to pray before Hashem with a broken heart, 
is given credit not for one korban, but as though he brought every type of sacrifice in the Beit HaMikdash. Zivche Elokin Ruach Nishbara. Zivche is plural. He gets credit as though he brought a multitude of sacrifices. And we find many cases in the Torah where these people who were poor, who had this broken heart, were gifted with an intellect, with a wit, where when they would come to collect from rich people, we find many cases where the poor man was able to make the rich man come out looking obviously far from intelligent, and many cases that alone impressed the rich man to an extent where he was happy to give a donation. One of the cases that the Ben Ishchai relates that's brought in the Midrash is <coughs> that there was once a case of a poor man who, because of his poverty, he obviously did not have any, his, his clothing was very tattered and dirty and dusty, and his shoes were ripped open, and when he would walk, in those days they didn't have cemented streets as we have today, a person would walk if it was rainy outside, and if a person's shoes were not constructed properly, they would pick up the mud from the street, and a person like this would walk into someone's house, they would leave a trail of mud all over the floor. One time, a poor man had the misfortune of knocking on the door of a very wealthy person whose house was very neat, the floors were marble, very clean, spotless, <clears throat> knocked on the door asking for coming to collect for a donation, and the maid opened the door and said, come in, wait, wait over here, I'll summon the master of the house. <clears throat> And she called the owner, the master of the house, who was a, a religious Jew, and this person came to see who was at the door, and he just looked at the floor and noticed the trail of mud that this person had brought into his house. He got so ir and he saw the appearance of this person, he got so irritated that he looked at the floor, he looked at this poor man, and he said, do me a favor, just get out. And he said it just like that. And this poor man obviously understood immediately that it was this item that had irritated this wealthy person, the fact that he saw the mess that had been made on the floor, <clears throat> and he said to this wealthy man, I'll, I'll leave right away, but ju just let me say one thing. This wealthy man said, fine. He said, there's a reason for this, there's a reason why I came in exactly in the manner that I did. Nothing, I, I didn't do this to dirty your house. He said, if you study the prayer, the Shachrit, that we say every day, one of the most important paragraphs that we have in the Shachrit is the Baruch She'amar. The Gemara tells us that this paragraph that we have say in Shachrit was actually a gift from heaven. This paragraph has in it exactly 87 words. The, the number 87 in Hebrew is Paz. Pe is 80, Zion is 7, Pe Zion, Paz is 87. And we know that in Hebrew the word Paz refers to the most expensive type of gold that exists in the world. The Gemara says there are, all, there are about 2 ounces of this Paz in the entire world. That's how precious an item this is. So the Mephashim tell us that this chapter, this paragraph of the Tefillah has in it exactly 87 words to show us that its value is that of Paz. That's how precious this paragraph of the Tefillah is. And this paragraph was revealed to the rabbis. It was actually a, a cablegram from heaven. The Shulchan Aruch writes that one day a paper came down from heaven and it fell to the ground, and the rabbis picked up this piece of paper, and on it was written that this was a tefillah that Hashem was presenting to the world. Hashem was notifying the Jews about this important prayer that a Jew is gifted with being permitted, being permitted to say every single day of the six days of the week. This tefillah, which begins with the words, Baruch She'amar V'haya Ha'olam. In this prayer, one of the sentences that we say there, one of the praises that we say about Hashem is, we say about Hashem, Baruch Merachem Al Ha'aretz, Blessed is Hashem who has pity on the Aretz, on the world, on the earth. Blessed is Hashem who has pity on the earth, Baruch Merachem Al Habriot. Blessed is Hashem who has pity on his creations. This is the sentence. Baruch Merachem Al Ha'aretz, Baruch Merachem Al Habriot. Blessed is Hashem who has pity on the earth, on the ground. Blessed is Hashem who has pity on people. This poor man said to this wealthy person, he said, the Gemara says that a Jew is supposed to emulate Hashem. Now, coming into a house as respectable as this, I assume that you were a Talmid Chacham, and you would certainly emulate Hashem. And just as I saw 
the type of pity, the type of concern that you showed for the ground, for the earth, that when your floor was made dirty, you showed tremendous concern by Hashem. The pas- we say, Baruch Merachem al Haaretz, that just as Hashem has pity on the ground, He also has pity on, on His creations. So I felt that by bringing out your pity on the floor, your concern for your clean floors, this would automatically also inspire you to have pity on Hashem's creation, to have pity on me, and you would certainly give me a worthy donation. And the manner in which this poor man presented this, this wealthy man laughed, he broke out in a smile, and he said, for that, I'll give you something, gladly. And he gave him a substantial donation. And we see here again the, the importance of Seichel, the importance of wisdom. The Mepharashim tell us that out of all the things that a person prays for in the Amidah, the Amidah is the holiest paragraph of the Tefillah that we say. It consists of 18 or 19 Berachot that we say nowadays. The first request that a Jew makes of Hashem, before a person prays for health, before a person prays for forgiveness, before a person prays for, ed- for redemption, the first thing that a Jew asks for in the Amidah is Da'at, Sechel, wisdom. Because the Pasuk says, Im Da'at Kanita Ma Chasata. A person who is Zochet to have Sechel, that person has everything. And a person who lacks Sechel, that person has nothing. We find that one of the items that we were Zochet to hear from, one of, again, one of the Tzadikim in Eretz Yisrael, Reb Michal Shrita, he once mentioned also, I believe this is brought from the Ben Ishchai. I'm almost sure that this is from the Ben Ishchai. That the, there's a Gemara that says that how did Moshe Rabbeinu become wealthy? We know that Moshe Rabbeinu, in his time, was one, was the wealthiest Jew. And the Gemara tells us that what made him so wealthy, when Hashem presented the Luchot, the tablets, to the Jewish people, the Luchot on which the Torah was written were made of the most precious stones in existence. Sapphires and very, very precious stones. In order for Hashem to inscribe the, the tablets, Hashem had to carve out the tablets were inscribed through and through, the letters showed through and through. So the Yemenah tells us that from the scrapings of these precious stones, those scrapings were given to Moshe Rabbeinu. Hashem gave Moshe Rabbeinu the remnants, the psolas of the luchot, and that's what made Moshe Rabbeinu so wealthy. He had these hundreds of precious sapphires and diamonds, these very, very precious stones, which made him very incredibly wealthy. One of the Mepharashim, I believe it's the Ben Ishchai, who asks, the question is, why is the Gemara telling us this? What do we care? Let's say this is true. Let's say this is to be taken literally, that Moshe Rabbeinu became physically wealthy, and his wealth happened to come from these stones. Who cares if his wealth came from these stones, or if it came from other stones, or if he was a shrewd businessman? What's the difference? Tell us that he's wealthy. There must be a, a significance to why it tells us that his wealth, he was very wealthy, and his wealth came from the psolas of the luchot, from the waste matter of the luchot, that's from where his wealth came from. What does this refer to? The answer is, we mentioned many times that in Hebrew, the letters, this is one of the items that the Mepharashim point out, a difference, a distinction between the Jews and Lahavdil, the Goyim. Note, people don't notice this. If you'll study the alphabet of any language of the Goyim, their letters have no fullness to them. They don't give birth to anything. There's a, the Zohar Kadosh says, Kel acher istaris velo avid perin. The Tum'ah is considered sterile. It doesn't produce. Tum'ah does not produce. The, the term that's attributed to Tum'ah is sterile, saris. That's the term. Whereas Kiddusha, holiness, is something that's fruitful. It bears fruit. This is the way we represent the two items. If you'll study any language of the Goyim, you'll note that their letters, for example, let's take English, A, B, C, it's one sound. The letter is one letter, A, and it sounds like only one letter. Whereas the Hebrew alphabet, Lashon Kodesh, is unique in that every single letter in Lashon Kodesh has a milui, it has a fullness. The letter Aleph, it's written as one letter, but it's not pronounced A, it's pronounced Aleph. Aleph, Lamet, Pe, as though it were written out as a word. It has a fullness to it. Bet, it's written as one letter, as B, as a B, Lahavdil in English, 
but it's not the le- the name of the letter is not B, it's Bet, as though it were written Bet Yud Taf. This is called the Milui of the word. Now note this fullness of the word when in our normal conversation or normally when we write that's considered in a sense the waste matter of the letter because factually when we write the letter bet we don't write bet you tough we just write bet and people know that this is the letter bet which when you pronounce it it's as though you were saying bet you tough so that filling out of the world of the word is called the psalis of the word, the waste matter in a sense of the word, meaning that we don't, at times, we don't see it, although it's really there. This, one of the Mepharashim brings, that if you study the word luchot, the Hebrew word of the luchot, the Gemara tells us that what made Moshe Rabbeinu wealthy, the psalis, the waste matter of the luchot. We said that the Gemara says that when is a Jew considered wealthy? When is a Jew considered as having everything? When he has secha, when he has dat. Dat is the true wealth of a person. The Mepharashim bring that if you study the psolas of the word luchot, the lamed, the memdalid, memdalid has a value of 44. The vav, the extra vav, the fullness of the word luchot is exactly bigimatria da'at showing that what's the message here? That when the Gemara says that Moshe Rabbeinu became wealthy from the, from the waste matter of the Luchot, we're not talking about millions of dollars. We're not, that what Would we refer to Moshe Rabbeinu as millionaire? That would be insulting to him. <coughs> we want to show that Moshe Rabbeinu knew what the true wealth is. What does the Torah say is considered a wealthy person? A person who has sechel, who has dat. And this is the hidden message when we say that where did Moshe Rabbeinu draw his wealth from? It was from the psolas of the luchot. If you study this word luchot in Hebrew, the psolas of it, the extra letters, the letters which we don't see, their numerical value is exactly begimatria dat. Halavai, we should be zochet by studying the words of the Torah, the words of Moshe Rabbeinu, the words of Hashem. We should be zochet to be filled with this da.